In the spring of 2009, detectives with California's Santa Ana Police Department were frustrated. They were trying to solve the brutal murder of a mother of four, a crime which had deeply unsettled the local community. While there had been plenty of leads at the beginning of the case, the investigation had now dragged on for seven months, with authorities having little to show for their efforts other than a series of wild goose chases. Fortunately, just when it looked like the case might go cold, detectives received a tip that would change everything. Now, the thing about this tip was that it didn't just point authorities towards a new suspect. You see, since the beginning of the investigation, there had actually been someone who was hiding in plain sight. Up until now, this person had everyone completely fooled. But with this fatal misstep, they had just unknowingly exposed the disturbing truth. Just a heads up before we begin, the names of a lot of people involved in today's story have been changed. We'll explain why a little later, but for the sake of transparency, we wanted to let you know that right off the bat. Okay, let's get into it. A little after 2 p.m. on September 18th, 2008, a man named Jonathan Reeves pulled into the driveway of a home on the 2700 block of North Lowell Lane in Santa Ana, California. The home belonged to Jonathan's mother, 49-year-old Darlene Sadler, who lived there with his two younger half-sisters. The place was nestled in the city's Morrison Park neighborhood, an area known for its lush greenery and well-maintained homes, the kind of quiet suburb where nothing out of the ordinary is ever supposed to happen. Sadly, that wasn't going to be the case that day. After parking his car, Jonathan started getting ready to unload some items. He was there to bring Darlene some furniture, so he was going to have to make a couple of trips in and out of the house. He hadn't been doing this for very long, when a thought occurred to him. It was unusual that he hadn't seen his mom yet. Normally, Darlene came outside as soon as she heard him pull up, or else would wave to him from the front window. Though Jonathan tried to tell himself that his mom was probably just busy, the next strange thing that he noticed was a lot harder to ignore. The front door to Darlene's house had been left unlocked, something that Jonathan couldn't remember ever happening before. Upon making his way inside, Jonathan headed towards the kitchen. It was here, moments later, that he made an awful discovery. His mother was lying face down and motionless on the floor. She was in a pool of blood, and most disturbing of all, there was a large knife sticking out of the back of her neck. Jonathan had barely began to process what he was seeing when another thought hit him like a sack of bricks. His youngest sister, five-year-old Ashley, was also supposed to be there at the house. In a full-blown panic, Jonathan ran to search for her. Thankfully, he quickly found Ashley in her room, physically unharmed. Though Jonathan was able to breathe a small sigh of relief, this feeling didn't last for very long. After calling 911, he quickly realized that the young girl had witnessed something truly terrifying. 911, what's the emergency? I walked into my house and my mom's laying on the floor in a pile of blood with a knife in her back. My little sister was here when I came in. I guess she's been here all day. Oh my God, oh my God. What did your sister say about the person who came in earlier? What happened, baby? He's killing her. We have knife. As the call continued, the 911 dispatcher asked Ashley for as many details about her mom's attacker as she could provide. Jonathan listened in horror as she described an unknown male intruder, one who she said was wearing all black and who strangely she said had blue hair. While the five-year-old was aware enough to know that something very bad had happened to her mother, it was clear that she didn't understand everything that was going on. Though she repeatedly stated that Darlene was dead, heartbreakingly, she talked about putting band-aids on her, as though this might still fix the situation. I killed my mom. I said, Mom, I killed her in the night. I killed her as I could walk. Blood came out of her. He was Jimmy with a black costume on and a black mask. Oh, he had a black mask? Uh-huh. Okay, do you remember what color his hair was? It's 
Blue? Blue? What do you mean, blue hair? Yeah, he showed my mom. He used my mom's knife. He took care of his back. I feel hurted. Okay. He's dead. Okay. And I cried. Yeah, I bet. I'm thinking about, I, I put some bandage on her. I oh. did it. I still think about it. When emergency responders arrived at the scene, sadly, Darlene Sadler was pronounced dead. One look at her injuries made it obvious that this was a murder, and the case was quickly handed over to detectives with the Santa Ana PD. Of course, the first thing that caught the attention of investigators was the same thing that everyone else had noticed when they saw Darlene's body, the large kitchen knife, which was still lodged in the back of her neck. The knife almost certainly belonged to Darlene, since there was one missing from a nearby knife block, and it appeared to match the others that were still there. While the knife wound was deep and likely would have been fatal on its own, it turned out that it was not the injury that had killed her. Her actual cause of death was three gunshot wounds to the head. An autopsy would soon reveal that these shots had been inflicted before Darlene had been stabbed. The autopsy also provided a rough time of death, which was estimated to be about 9.30 a.m. Disturbingly, this meant that Ashley had likely been in the house with her mother's body for several hours before Jonathan had arrived. Given the amount of blood evidence in the kitchen, which included spatter on the cabinets and high up on the walls, detectives concluded that this is where the murder had taken place. This wasn't the only location blood was recovered, however. Some more of it was found smeared on one of the front door jams, and much smaller droplets were discovered on the floor in the hallway. Some of these last bits of blood look like they could have been quite a bit older than the rest of the evidence found at the crime scene, though nonetheless, all of it was sent away for testing. The final clue found at the scene was equally as promising, a single 22 caliber shell casing. Since Darlene had been shot three times, detectives speculated that the killer had picked up the other two casings. It appeared that they had been unable to find this one, though, which was sitting on the kitchen counter. Given the brutality of Darlene Sadler's murder, one thing was immediately clear to investigators. Someone really wanted to make sure that she was dead. Unfortunately, as they were about to learn, there was no shortage of people who could have been responsible. While some members of the investigative team continued processing the crime scene, Darlene's youngest daughter, Ashley, was taken in for further questioning to see if there was any other information she might be able to provide. Given her age, this was handled very delicately, and the actual interview was conducted by a trained mental health professional who specialized in working with kids who have gone through traumatic events. For the most part, Ashley repeated the details that she had already given to the 911 dispatcher over the phone. Once again, she stated that the killer had been dressed in all black, this time saying that he, quote, looked like a ninja. The blue hair part is a little less clear. None of the sources we came across mention Ashley ever bringing this detail up again, and it appears that detectives simply chalked this up to the girl's mind struggling to process what she had witnessed. Before the interview was over, Ashley also agreed to draw two pictures of what she had seen. Both look completely innocent at first glance, but are quite disturbing with the context. The first drawing, Ashley said, was of her mom lying on the floor with her eyes closed. The second was of the knife that was in her back. Not wanting to push the young girl any further considering what she had already been through, authorities decided to end their interviews with her here. They then moved on to Darlene's other children, who they wanted to speak to both as potential suspects and as sources of information about the 49-year-old's life. Understandably, Jonathan was the first person to be looked at, since he was the one that had alerted police to the murder. However, he was quickly ruled out as a person of interest. Jonathan was able to provide detectives with a detailed accounting of his day leading up to the discovery of the crime. He had been at work all the way up until the time that he had brought the furniture over to his mom's house, something that was verified by his employer. After he was no longer considered a suspect, 
Jonathan was able to provide a lot of background information about his mother's life. Of Darlene's four children, he had been the closest to her. Jonathan said that Darlene was incredibly hardworking and had always done what she could to provide the best life possible for him and his siblings. This was all the more impressive because she had done it more or less on her own. Sadly, she had been incredibly unlucky when it came to relationships. When Darlene was in her 20s, she gave birth to Jonathan and his sister Jessica. However, things had taken a tragic turn when the children's father passed away when they were still very young. At the time, Jonathan was only two years old. Darlene eventually remarried, giving birth to another daughter, Shauna, in 1992. The relationship only lasted a couple of years before Shauna's dad walked out on the family, before leaving the country altogether. A few years later, it looked like Darlene had gotten a third shot at love when she met and fell in love with a man named David. They got married as well, with Darlene giving birth to Ashley in 2003. Unfortunately, this marriage also fell apart. At the time of Darlene's murder, David had moved out and was living on his own in the city of Bakersfield, while Darlene was living with Shauna and Ashley. Since Jonathan and Jessica were older, they had already moved out on their own a few years earlier. Despite her troubled romantic relationships, Jonathan was adamant that Darlene had been a wonderful mother to all of her children. Anything they needed, she found a way to provide, no matter how hard she had to work. Even then, she always seemed to have plenty of energy left over to do fun things with them as well. Overall, Jonathan said, his mom was just a good and kind-hearted person. While Jonathan clearly thought the world of his mother, as detectives conducted more interviews, they found out that not everyone shared his opinion. In fact, there were a surprising amount of people who seemingly wished Darlene harm. The first name to be brought up was Darlene's most recent husband, David. While authorities were planning to look into him no matter what, they were even more intrigued when he was proposed as a possible suspect by Darlene's 15-year-old daughter, Shauna. Like Jonathan, Shauna was initially looked at as a possible suspect herself. However, she was ruled out after police discovered she also had a solid alibi. Since it was a Thursday, Shauna had been at school when the murder took place. She was dropped off there at 7.15 a.m. by Darlene that morning, and her attendance was confirmed in all of her classes. Just as an aside, Jessica was also ruled out around this time, though sources don't really say much about her. Anyway, when detectives moved to asking Shauna more general questions about her mom's life, she told them that she was worried David might be involved in her murder. Darlene and David had met about 10 years earlier while they were both attending a party for one of their mutual friends. They hit it off and were married two years later. Though the relationship had been happy at first, Shauna explained that things took a sharp decline when her younger sister Ashley was born. Around that time, David lost his job as a touring musician, and he turned to drugs and alcohol, something that he had already struggled with in the past. According to Shauna, David's addiction issues created tensions in his and Darlene's marriage. Darlene wasn't the kind of person to put up with that sort of thing, especially around her kids. When she pushed back, David became physically and verbally abusive. That's when Darlene decided to end the relationship. They had settled in Santa Ana, and David had moved about 150 miles north to Bakersfield. This is where things really got interesting for investigators, though. Shauna said that at first, she believed this was the end of things. She, her mom, and her younger sister were doing well, and it seemed like they were moving on with their lives. However, she claimed that David wouldn't leave them alone. A few months before the murder, David showed up suddenly, saying that he wanted to patch things up. He told Darlene that he had changed and that he wanted to try and bring their family back together. Shauna said that David managed to convince her mom that he was serious, and deciding that it was best for Ashley to have her father in her life, Darlene agreed to try and make it work. They made plans to move and put a deposit down together on a home in Santa Clarita, roughly halfway between Bakersfield and Santa Ana. As it got closer to moving day, though, Shauna said it became more and more apparent to Darlene that she had been tricked. David hadn't cleaned up his act at all. He was still using drugs and alcohol heavily, 
and Darlene worried that he wouldn't be capable of being a responsible parent. When Darlene confronted David with her concerns, Shauna said that he flew into a rage. They got into a huge fight, during which David had accused her of trying to steal his family. He went on to threaten that if Darlene didn't make the right choice, she, quote, wouldn't be around. This ominous threat had happened less than a month before Darlene's murder. As some members of the investigative team got to work looking further into Darlene's estranged husband, David, others began exploring additional leads. It wasn't long before several more suspects had emerged. First, there was a man in his 20s named Justin, who detectives learned had lived with Darlene and the family a couple of years earlier. Justin was the son of one of Darlene's close friends and was also close to Jonathan. Darlene had known Justin since he was a boy, so when he had a falling out with his parents in 2006, Darlene agreed to take him in for a while. At first, things were pretty normal. However, at some point, something had happened between him and Shauna. Justin claimed that they were in a consensual relationship, but Darlene thought something more sinister was going on. Though the truth about what actually happened is extremely unclear, what we know is that Shauna was 14 and Justin was 18 at the time that this took place. At best, Darlene thought the relationship was inappropriate, so she kicked Justin out of the house. Authorities learned that Justin had responded to this with a lot of anger, with some saying they remembered him making threats. It had been more than a year since all of this went down, but police had to consider the possibility that Justin was still holding a grudge. It turned out that this wasn't the only roommate gone wrong situation that Darlene had dealt with either. Things had also gotten contentious with another man named Albert. Darlene and Albert had first met 20 years earlier and had remained good friends throughout that time. A few months before Darlene's murder, Albert got into a bit of a jam. He lost the lease on his longtime apartment and didn't have anywhere to stay. Since Darlene had a spare bedroom at her house, she agreed to rent it to Albert for a small amount of money. Just like with Justin, at first, things seemed to be going okay. However, after a while, Albert started making Darlene's kids feel uncomfortable, and he stopped paying her the rent that they had agreed to. When Darlene asked Albert to leave, he agreed, but he made no attempt to hide that he was angry about it. In fact, detectives learned that he had gone on to say something that now looked incredibly suspicious. This was actually one of the final things that Ashley had mentioned during her interview with the mental health workers. She said that a couple of weeks earlier, she and her mom had been at the grocery store when they were confronted by Albert in the parking lot. During a heated rant, Albert had threatened to stab Darlene in the neck. When detectives looked into Albert's background, they discovered something else. He had a previous criminal record that included aggravated assault and domestic violence. The final suspect that authorities found came when they were doing a canvas of Darlene's neighborhood. During conversations with neighbors, several of them mentioned a sober living home that was less than a mile away. A number of them stated that sketchy characters sometimes hung out there and that a lot of people came and went from the place in general. Detectives went to the residence where they spoke to the home's supervisor. Almost immediately, the supervisor shared his suspicions about a particular resident who he said was named Craig. The supervisor said that Craig had been acting strangely recently and in fact had taken off abruptly just hours after Darlene's murder. Later that day, he had called the sober living home and explained that he had to leave town, though wouldn't say why. As it happened, the only other detail he did provide looked even more suspicious. He said that he was in Bakersfield, the same city where Darlene's estranged husband David lived. Authorities wondered, was it possible the two were connected? Detectives now had quite the list of suspects, each of whom seemed like they could have been involved in Darlene's murder. The question now was which one, if any of them, was actually responsible? Luckily, police were about to get an incredibly useful lead that would help them find out. Little did they know, however, the results wouldn't be anything close to what they expected.
Several days into the investigation, detectives with the Santa Ana Police Department received an update from the Orange County Crime Lab. A preliminary analysis of the blood from the murder scene had come back. The results were promising and a little bit confusing. As expected, the vast majority of the blood in the house belonged to Darlene Sadler. The blood found smeared on the door jam did not and was determined to be from an unknown male. Strangely though, there was blood from a third person at the scene as well. The dried blood droplets in the hall belonged to an unknown female. The first people this blood evidence was tested against were Darlene's children, since they had already provided their DNA. None of them were a match, except for Shauna, whose DNA matched the blood found in the hall. Understandably, detectives were intrigued by this, so they brought the 15-year-old in for questioning again. However, she was able to provide an explanation. As authorities had suspected, this blood was older than the other evidence at the scene. Shauna stated that it had come from a while earlier when she had been self-harming. To back up what she was saying, the teen showed detectives injuries to her wrists, which were consistent with her story. She said that she hadn't mentioned this earlier because she wasn't doing it anymore, and she worried that if she brought it up, police would have forced her to go into a mental health institution. With this bit of confusion cleared up, detectives moved on to the more promising DNA evidence, the blood that had been found smeared on the door jam. They reasoned that this almost certainly belonged to the killer. One by one, they started questioning their list of male suspects, asking for DNA samples from each of them. The first one of the suspects to be interviewed was Darlene's estranged husband, David. Right away, David disputed the characterization that had been painted of him by Shauna and others, stating that his relationship with Darlene had never been violent or abusive. He admitted that they had their fair share of problems, but denied ever threatening Darlene. He also claimed that the plan to move back in together was still on. David provided detectives with an alibi for September 18th, saying that he had been at work all day during the time the murder took place. When authorities looked into this, they discovered that his alibi was ironclad. He was at his job in Bakersfield, and there were many people there who were willing to attest to this. Of course, by this point, there was also the question of the man from the sober living home, Craig. It seemed very convenient to investigators that Craig just happened to be going to Bakersfield when he suddenly left town after the murder. They wondered if maybe David had hired Craig to carry out the crime. If so, perhaps he was heading there to collect his money. Things momentarily got even more interesting when detectives were shown a pair of boots by the supervisor of the sober living home that Craig had apparently left behind. There were stains on the boots that looked like they could be blood. However, when this was tested, it turned out to be oil. On top of this, no connection between David and Craig could be found. Still, DNA from both men was collected and sent off for comparison. The next people detectives spoke with were Darlene's two former disgruntled roommates, Justin and Albert. Both men had excuses for why what had happened between them and the 49-year-old was nowhere near as bad as what investigators had heard. During his interview, Justin reiterated that he and Shauna had been in a genuine relationship. He said he was mad when Darlene had kicked him out, but he said he had gotten over it pretty quickly. He certainly denied ever making any kind of threat. Albert, on the other hand, was completely upfront about the fact that he had said the thing about stabbing Darlene in the neck when he saw her and Ashley at the grocery store. However, when he spoke to police, he claimed that the whole thing was a joke. You know, one of those totally hilarious neck-stabbing jokes. I mean, what's a little murder amongst friends, am I right? Luckily for Albert, while he may have been guilty of crimes against comedy, he wasn't a murderer. He had a solid alibi that was backed up by both his girlfriend and a doctor's appointment on September 18th, and when his DNA was tested against the unknown male sample from the door jam, it was not a match. However, this is where things also got a bit more complicated. You see, none of the other suspects were a match to the blood evidence either. David, Craig, Justin, all of them were innocent as well. As a last Hail Mary, 
Detectives submitted the unknown DNA sample from the crime scene to CODIS. Once again, though, they struck out. At this point, the investigation had hit a brick wall. Authorities were totally out of leads, and all the ones that they did have had resulted in dead ends. As weeks began to pass, the situation only grew more desperate. Detectives didn't want to admit it, but the case was quickly going cold. Fortunately, authorities were about to get a final lead. This lead would not only reveal who had killed Darlene Sadler, but would uncover something that police had been missing since the beginning of their investigation. Several months after the murder of Darlene Sadler, detectives with the Santa Ana police received a phone call out of the blue. It was from Jonathan Reeves, who said that he might have crucial new information about who had killed his mother. Jonathan explained that he had been at home when he was contacted by his sister, Shauna. She was in a state of obvious distress and said that she had just figured out who was responsible for their mom's murder. Through tears over the phone, Shauna told Jonathan about her ex-boyfriend, 18-year-old Brian Landry. She said that she was almost positive he was behind the killing. Shauna met Brian just a few months before Darlene's murder. At the time, she was a junior in high school and he was a graduating senior. They spent most of that summer together, but the relationship didn't last. A lot of that, Shauna said, had to do with the fact that Brian took things way too seriously. Shauna told Jonathan that the reason she was suspicious of Brian was because of how their relationship had ended. Now, Shauna said that she had been thinking about breaking things off with Brian anyway, but the whole thing became a way bigger deal when her mom got involved. Specifically, she said that Brian went to Darlene and told her that he wanted to marry Shauna. Darlene said he was crazy. They were too young, especially Shauna. Then she said she didn't want Brian coming around the house anymore. Shauna stated that she hadn't initially said anything about Brian after her mom's murder because by that point they hadn't been together for a while. But the more she thought about it, the more she worried, especially because she knew Brian was really into guns and had a few of them at his house. After getting all of this information from Jonathan, Santa Ana detectives looked further into Brian Landry's background. At first glance, he looked like the last person who would be capable of a heinous murder. Brian had no prior criminal history. He hadn't even been arrested before. He was in college full-time studying languages and religion and seemed like a pretty normal teen. When detectives looked a little further into Brian's social media activity, though, they started to see what they thought was evidence of an unhealthy obsession with firearms and violence. He had made numerous posts to his MySpace page, showing himself with all kinds of weapons and tactical gear. One of these photos, in particular, caught the attention of investigators. A grainy image in which Brian appeared to be dressed completely in black. A ski mask was covering his face. They wondered, was this the ninja Ashley had seen on the day Darlene was murdered? With this, detectives decided they needed to test Brian's DNA. However, they didn't want to tip him off just yet about what was going on. So instead of bringing him in for an interview, they came up with a clever workaround instead. It just so happened that a little while earlier, Brian had reported a bike stolen. Knowing this, detectives asked him to come down to the station, telling him that they had recently busted up a theft ring and that they were trying to track down the possible owners of several recovered bicycles. When Brian came in, authorities showed him several pictures of bikes, telling him to point out if any of them were his. Of course, these were just totally random photos. This wasn't actually what they were after. Instead, Police wanted to see if they could get Brian to drink from a bottle of water that they offered him to obtain his DNA. Sure enough, he took the bait, and after this, the bottle was sent away for testing. Analysis revealed that Brian's DNA was a match to the blood at the crime scene. On April 16th, 2009, so almost exactly seven months after Darlene Sadler's murder, Brian Landry was brought in for questioning. Unaware what evidence authorities had against him, 
At first, the 18-year-old was remarkably calm in the interview room. When asked, he told detectives that he had a good relationship with Darlene in the time that he had known her, though couldn't remember the last time he'd been at her house. As for the day of the murder, he was pretty sure he'd gone to a campus Christian event at Cypress College, where he was a student. How did you get along with Darlene? Uh, not too bad. Not too bad. Yeah, I actually helped her out with uh, some stuff around the house. Do you remember when the last time you were at the house prior to Darlene's murder? Not date-wise, no. Do you, do you remember the uh, the actual day that this incident happened? Yeah, it was with my friend John. And we were going to go to the Campus Christian thing. That starts at like 10 o'clock, I think. Detectives kept Brian feeling comfortable, allowing him to lie and answer their questions however he wanted. The entire time, he was unaware that he was actually digging himself into a hole that he wouldn't be able to talk his way out of. Finally, after roughly two hours, they started to confront him with what they knew. You can say you're with your friend, you can say all these other things. We've got a lot of evidence to prove otherwise. You think we got your DNA? Yours is there at a specific location. Not just, I'm not talking prints, I'm not talking saliva. And unfortunately, it's what's gonna, it's what's gonna get you in trouble. You killed Darlene, whether you want to face it or not. You can never run from something like this. It'll always follow you. It's time, man. Let tell us what happened. What happened? Doesn't it be like Miranda rights or something? Despite what he said in that last bit there. Brian ended up waiving his rights and agreeing to continue talking with detectives. What he said from here was truly chilling. Brian admitted that yes, he had killed Darlene, but it wasn't his idea. The whole plan, he said, all of it had been thought up by Darlene's daughter, his ex-girlfriend, Shauna. By now, detectives already had more than a few suspicions about Shauna. In fact, this had been the case ever since that phone call with Jonathan. The call out of the blue left them with a strange feeling, and when investigators looked into Shauna's phone records, they learned why. It turned out that she had been lying to them. She hadn't cut off contact with Brian like she previously said. In actuality, she had been texting him before, during, and after her mother's murder. Even with their suspicions of Shauna, however, detectives were stunned by what Brian told them next. Brian explained that after their breakup, Shauna blamed the whole thing on her mom. Not only that, but she was furious about the possibility of Darlene getting back together with her stepdad, David. Shauna said her mom was going to uproot their whole lives and force her to leave her friends and school behind. But she had come up with a way to solve all of her problems. She just needed Brian's help to get her mom out of the way. After all, Brian was good with guns. Brian said initially he refused to play any part in Darlene's murder, but Shauna wouldn't give up. She kept trying tactic after tactic until one worked. Shauna said that if Brian didn't help her, that she would do it herself when she turned 18. At that point, she would also take her own life as well. She kept asking me to do it. And I tried to coax her out of it. I kept trying. She wouldn't lay off. No. What pushed you over that that edge that you decided to go ahead and do it? So uh, once you turned 18, she'd uh, kill herself and her mom. So she was threatening to kill herself and her mom mm -hmm. unless you did this? Mm -hmm. And you thought by removing Darlene, you try to help her out with that, keep her from doing harm to herself. Mm -hmm. Brian said that after he finally agreed to do what Shauna wanted, they chose a date and time for the murder that would take as much suspicion off of her as possible. They decided on September 18th because it was a day that Shauna would be in school, but Brian didn't have any college classes. That morning, 
Brian grabbed a backpack and filled it with the items he needed to carry out the murder. These included a handgun, the black clothing and mask that Ashley had seen, and a pair of gloves. He then rode his bike to the crime scene, arriving at around 9 a.m. When Brian got there, Darlene and Ashley still weren't home from dropping Shauna off at school. He used the time to change into the clothing he brought, then unlocked the front door from the inside by reaching through the mail slot. He went inside and then waited for his victim to return home. How did you get into the house? I locked it from the inside. What'd you unlock? A door, a window? Door. The front door? Mm. How, how do you unlock it from the inside? Mail slot. So you're actually able to reach in the mail slot? Yeah. Once Darlene returned home, Brian waited a few minutes before sneaking up on her in the kitchen. He shot her in the head and she fell to the ground. But at that point, there was an unexpected complication. The noise of the gunshot alerted Ashley, who came running to see what was going on. Not wanting her to witness anything else, Brian said he took the child back to her room before returning to the kitchen. He shot Darlene twice more and then used a kitchen knife to inflict the last disturbing wound. Brian claimed that he needed to make sure that Darlene was actually dead. In the process, he accidentally cut himself though, which is how he ended up leaving the blood on the door jam. When it was all over, he fled the scene, stopping only to text Shauna to let her know that the crime was complete. How long was she home before you actually made contact with her? About 10 minutes. About 10 minutes. What was she doing? Making food? She was facing the sink, and then you walked up on her. Did you shoot her, or did you stab her? Shot her. She fell. She fell. What did you do next? Take a knife. It's on the counter. What did you do with the knife? Is that everything fine? Make sure it's done. Would you text her? It's, uh... It's done. It's done. Yeah. When asked about the shell casings from his gun, Brian admitted he picked up two of them at the scene. He said he thought the third had fallen down the drain of the sink, explaining why it had been left behind. Following Brian's confession, authorities conducted ballistics testing on his handgun. It was a match to the casings found at the scene. Despite Brian's heinous actions, Investigators were convinced that he was telling the truth about the plan being Shauna's. By this point, it was clear to them that she had been pulling the strings behind the scenes since the very beginning of the investigation. She had created an alibi for herself. She had tried to steer the investigation towards her stepdad. And when that had failed, she had tried to pin the blame solely on Brian. Detectives further reasoned that Brian would have made an easy target for manipulation. He was clearly obsessed with Shauna, and they knew firsthand that she could be quite persuasive. As one member of the investigative team later put it, quote, there were times during the interviews where if you weren't careful, you would realize, wait a minute, she's interviewing me. And if she's able to do that to an experienced homicide detective, how hard is it to manipulate an 18 year old boy who has a crush on you? Brian and Shauna were both arrested and charged with murder and conspiracy to commit murder. Brian was ultimately convicted on both counts, and in 2012 was sentenced to 25 years to life for his role in Darlene Sadler's murder. Shauna was also convicted, but because of her age, the maximum penalty she could receive was much lower. As a result, she could only be incarcerated until the age of 25. Shauna's age is also the reason that, as we mentioned before, most of the names in this story had to be changed. And due to California state laws, her name was never allowed to be publicly released because she was a minor at the time of the crime. Now, that being said, we did come across her real name in court records, and you can probably find it yourself if you really want to and are willing to do a bit of searching. We opted not to share this, though, both because we didn't want to get into any shaky legal territory ourselves, and because in this case, we did want to give a bit of consideration to the privacy of Darlene's youngest child. 
We kept Jonathan's name real, however, because he has actually participated in shows in the past that have detailed the case. Of course, Darlene and Brian's names are also real. Again, we just wanted to let you know all of that for the sake of full disclosure. Anyway, according to the latest reports, Shauna was released from state custody in 2017. Inmate records indicate that Brian Landry is eligible for parole as of November of 2025. I know that some of you think I say this too often, but honestly, I feel like this is the most messed up story we've covered in a while. Normally, I'm pretty hesitant to assign full culpability for crimes like this when the person responsible is a minor. A lot of stuff changes in your brain and your life in general when you're a teenager. And while that's not an excuse for terrible behavior, it should be taken into consideration. I'll admit though, this was a challenging one. The more I read about Shauna, the more I was also convinced that she knew exactly what she was doing. To be honest, I'm still really torn about what I really think. What isn't at all up for debate, though, is the hole that Darlene Sadler's tragic murder left in the lives of all of the people that she loved. In an interview we came across, I found it particularly heartbreaking when Jonathan talked about how even the happiest moments in life for him are now tinged with a bit of sadness. Jonathan runs a successful business and has a happy family of his own. But the more good things that happen, the more he feels like his mother is missing. That's a really heavy thing to think about. In that same interview, Jonathan mentioned that Shauna has tried to contact him many times since her release. He says that he's no longer interested in having any kind of a relationship with her though. To be honest, I can't say that I blame him. Before we wrap up, we'd like to take a second to give a huge shout out to everyone who has made it this far into the video. Seriously, thank you so much for watching. If you found today's upload interesting and informative, we'd be honored if you consider liking and subscribing, as well as hitting the notification bell and selecting all notifications to stay up to date with our latest releases. If you're looking for additional ways to help support the channel, we'd love to have you join us over on Patreon. Patrons get ad-free and early access to all of our content, as well as four additional stories per week for each of our Crimes of the Week and Crimes of the Week International videos. You can learn more at patreon.com slash crimezone, where you'll also find some of the fine folks whose names are currently on screen. All that being said, we understand that not everyone has the means to support financially, and that's totally okay. We appreciate every like, sub, share, and comment that you send our way. Once again, thanks so much everyone, and take care.